Welcome to the My Name is Human podcast. We are an Earth2.io podcast brought to you by Earth2 News. My name is Aaron. And my name is Cole. And today we have Jawad from Republic Finance. Uh, we uh, know a little bit about you, Jawad, from our uh, Google stocking. Uh, I mean searches. Uh, <laughs> but we'd love to hear your story in your own words. Who are you? How did you get to where you are today? And, and tell us a little bit about your role with Republic. For sure, for sure. Uh, I So I'm Jawad, and I'm one of the managing directors and head of growth here at Republic Real Estate. Uh, I started my career in the hedge fund world. I spent the majority of my career in distressed debt uh, across a couple of prominent hedge funds here in New York and investment banks. Uh, I did that for a few years before I had migrated over to, to the Silicon Valley world uh, and started my own company called Share Trade, which was uh, an investment app that very similar to, to Robinhood, we launched in late 2015, 2016, uh, that allowed you to buy fractional shares in, in public securities. And we built out an interesting trading engine. Uh, and unfortunately, that business we really shut down. Uh, but I've advised several other companies in, in real estate, in, in prop tech, uh, and, and really um, manifested this space in, in Republic Real Estate with Janine Yorio. Uh, when I joined her company, Compound, as one of the founding team members, Compound allowed you to buy fractional shares uh, in, in condos all across the world and allowed you to build out a, a real estate portfolio for as little as $100. And Republic acquired us back in June 2020 of just a few months ago. And we've we've what I've been focused on here at Republic is almost entirely capital markets, uh, and and finding, and uh, collaborating with investors who who have a deep appetite for some of the interesting projects that we're pursuing, uh, notably here being the virtual real estate funds, uh, and and really bridging the the lines or in fact blurring the lines between real real estate and, and virtual real estate. So that's been, I mean, we've been following metaverses for quite some time. And my colleague, TJ Kawamura, had put uh, metaverses on our, on our radar for quite some time. Uh, I was following the central end even before they went into beta and really seeing how it, you know, investors and users were viewing land. I know in the beginning, it was really a land grab uh, uh, before they went into beta. But for us, it's been really exciting to see that a lot of the valuation principles that exist in the real world with real land, they migrate over quite uh, closely into the virtual world. You know, the famous axiom of location, location, location really persists and, and, and shows itself in these virtual worlds. Uh, and um, understand and not, not just location, 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 but co-location, knowing where interesting projects are happening in a given metaverse and being near them uh, and, and collaborating with other folks who are, who are buying land and building cool things on it. You know, I appreciate the speculator and I can appreciate that hypothesis, but us as a fund, we, we're taking a very different approach uh, in terms of being active participants in these metaverses. And that would entail really incubating certain ideas uh, and projects and, uh, and, idea, um, and other engaging activities on these parcels. Uh, for them to really grow and, and the catalyst for these for the growth is really going to be community engagement. So I know that's a lot in a nutshell, but um, that's that's really what I'm focused on here at Republic. Well, yeah, that, that was a lot of information. I, I think that the, the really interesting thing and something we that Aaron and I talk about quite a bit is community engagement and you were talking about that. So I, I just wanted to ask, I know this isn't one we we discussed beforehand, but but what does that look like? for Republic to, you know, interact with the community? Are you, you know, like, for instance, I'll give an example of, of what I'm thinking. Um, Aaron and I are in the Earth2IO Discord. So is that something that informal that you would go in to see what kinds of plans people have? Absolutely, absolutely. That is, it's a, it's a great destination for us to see uh, the types of discussions people are having, content creators, and what I truly love about this new blockchain universe 
is the collaborative nature with ev almost everyone I've interfaced with in this in this new sector. Uh, everyone is more than willing to help and, and flesh out ideas. Uh, so the, the Discord community is, is a good destination for that. Uh, we are also very well connected with, with some of the larger investors, whether they're institutions or individuals, uh, and are collaborating with them just like in the real world. And I'm going to use an example here. I'm in, based out of New York City and Brooklyn, a uh, neighborhood called Williamsburg about 15, 20 years ago was... I mean, for a lack of better terms, it was like Fallujah. It was a very dangerous neighborhood. And it's it's really evolved into something else. It started with the artist community and then business started sprouting out around it. And these businesses, whether it's a restaurant, a cafe, or some other uh, um, type of business, they are collaborating with each other to understand where they're positioning their business. And it's, it's really those investors uh, and that thought process of collaborating with other landowners to figure out where their businesses and how my business can potentially help yours and vice versa. Yeah. That's so, yeah. So just, just one thought I just wanted to clear out is we we're actively engaged with those types of investors and, and, and users who have made it a considerable investment into the land and now are adding more resources in terms of hiring architects or developers or game engineers to build up cool, exciting stuff on their parcel. And, and we are being synergistic by building cool attractions around their stuff that's complementary to what they're building. Yeah, and that's exciting. That's a lot, uh, stuff that Cole and I talk about all the time is kind of what we can expect in the future with these metaverses and what we can do after buying. So we right now we're buying land, but mm -hmm. we're not really doing anything with it, but that's going to come. And, and, you know, having the creative people putting things up and making exciting things for people to experience either through augmented reality or virtual reality is really exciting. So the question I have is, when did virtual land kind of first pop up on Republic's radar and what kind of due diligence was done? So we've been following metaverses for well over a year. Um, and, and this was even before our incarnation as Republic Real Estate. This is when we were just compound. Uh, and, and we were deeply looking at these platforms, understanding the teams behind them uh, and, and the vision beyond it as well. Um, for us, what was really important, and, and in hindsight, it was the right variable to look at is the level of conviction the early adopters have, right? Your early adopter is going to really drive the, the progress of these metaverses. They're willing to take the, the emotional scar tissues when things break down in the metaverse, whether it's a bug in the system or, your, or the game crashes, they're willing to endure it because A, they've probably made some sort of investment into the platform or B, they already have an uh, embedded community that they're highly engaged with. So I would say for the operators of these metaverses, cater to your early adopters and listen to them very carefully. And that's exactly what we did when it came to Decentraland. My, my, my colleagues and I, we've all personally have invested in, in a metaverse. We've invested in Decentraland or Sandbox. Um, and, and a few others that are up and coming, we've all made personal investments and have really immersed ourselves in this, into these metaverses over the past year and a half to really understand what's going to drive it. And it all comes back to your early foundational community. That really matters. What, and, and for the platforms that have yet to build out an immersive world, and there are so many of them that are making these you know, really impressive promises, that I think what's really important today is to look at a platform and see how close they are to actually launching a 3D visualized world where you can have an avatar traversing those lands. Uh, you know, land prices are going to trade within a very tight collar until a metaverse is really opened. Um, and once it opens, that's when the exciting stuff starts happening. I I can say that with Decentraland, when we first when I first started playing around in it, it was really just barren, and it still is kind of barren. There's not a lot of stuff going on yet. And any given moment, there could be just a few hundred people on the servers. But we're seeing accelerated growth, 
and migration into these metaverses. And by the way, they're still in beta. So we're not expecting to see you know, the servers accommodating hundreds of thousands of millions of, or millions of users. That's coming in time and we understand that progressive timeline. But, but really to, to, to answer your question in terms of diligence is to understand the foundational community, understand what they're excited about, what they're building towards, and, and really ask yourself, is this platform truly decentral? Uh, if I love the fact that the central land allows users to run their own nodes, and I think that's a very important uh, consideration to make uh, when you are exploring sandbox, for example, sandbox. I, I, you know, I'm very hopeful for their future, but an individual cannot run their own node or server in that platform. So the question of whether it's decentralized or not really comes into play here. Uh, is it really decentralized if I can't run my own server or my own node? Uh, that's another aspect. I think you know the developers of these metaverses should really, really ask themselves if our team was to disappear tomorrow, will the game still go on? And if the answer to that is yes, uh, we're hyper interested. We want to figure out, I mean, some, this is really some of the technical stuff that's important to us, but it, it really matters. And, and it matters because we want the full manifestation of decentralized uh, and, and having aspects around, uh, you know, being liberal with nodes and allowing people to build those uh, is important. I know it seems very artificial today, but it, it is really important. Well, I think that that, I mean, transitions really well into the next next thing I wanted to ask about, which is what types of characteristics you're really looking for within these different metaverses. And you've already touched on strength of community um, and how close they appear to be to actually, you know, delivering um, a 3D metaverse to, to the users. So in that spirit, what are some of the other things that you look for with a metaverse? And is tying, you know, are the land parcels being tied to cryptocurrency or blockchain or NFTs in some way, some of these uh, decentralized concepts, are those, is that a requirement when you're looking at something? I, I mean, I, transitively, I want to say yes, right? Because a lot of those elements are important for a decentralized world to even function. And by that, I mean, a blockchain ledger, uh, transparency into transactions. Uh, these are all these are all the type of things and, and scarcity, for example. Uh, these are all the things that are hyper important to to a decentralized world growing. And these are some of the elements we look at. I, I'm really concerned about uh, scarcity because I'm seeing some of these um, metaverses now launching with you know billions, if not trillions, of parcels. And I and I. On the, you know, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. There's there's danger in the sense that there's way too much, uh, to way too many parcels or, or pixels uh, available for sale. And on the other hand, the pro is that it's kind of really future proofing the platform, right? Uh, and and as we all, I mean, I, I believe all of us on this podcast believe that this is the future. So having billions or trillions of, of parcels minted and readily available is, is a good way to future proof, but perhaps it may be, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how that's gonna play out in terms of scarcity, but it'll be interesting to see uh, if, if some of these metaverses were to withhold some of those parcels and keep it in the inventory and release them in batches, uh, like some of these other platforms have done. Um, I think another, another variable that's really important for us, and this is more qualitative, is to get a good understanding of the partnerships that are already in these metaverses. So if you're seeing certain big brands uh, or institutions taking a position in these worlds, that's a signal, right? That's, a, that's an important signal. Um, and, and I think the most famous example here is really the sandbox. Uh, it's, you know, they have partnerships with Atari, uh, who are Binance and, and Galaxy Digital and a couple of other prominent names. I, I believe Nike owns a large parcel in Sandbox. So that, that seems to be a good indicator as to, the, as to how vibrant a given world is going to be in the future. 
But really, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to, you know, that, that dopamine hit in the metaverse, right? And if some of the tech solutions within these metaverses makes it conducive for people to keep coming back, I can say... For example, gas fees have been a huge barrier uh, for people to really spend meaningful amount of time in the metaverse. Because if I was to transfer, you know, a, a piece of virtual art to you as an NFT, even as a gift, uh, the recipient is still on the hook for you know fifty, sixty, maybe a hundred dollars worth of gas fees. Uh, that just is just shipping and handling, and and I, I don't see millions of people being okay with that. So from a tech standpoint, I know Decentraland released a layer two solution with Polygon Matic that eliminates all in-game transaction fees and it's making it more frictionless. And these little things are, are making it more attractive for people to come into the world. You know, even though I spent the majority of my adult life in finance and other sophisticated investment products, I'm, I'm also a painter and I, I minted one of my paintings uh, into an NFT and so somebody, you know, bought it. And now as an artist, uh, I, it's, I want to build an art gallery in one of these metaverses. And I also look at, you know, the foundational community of, of artists and musicians who are, are, are adapting into these worlds, adopting these worlds as their go-to place to showcase their work and also obtain financial liberty and freedom as an artist who can, fully crystallize and, and, and get appropriate compensation for their work, uh, not just at the initial sale, but through royalties. And that's the beauty of the blockchain here, where it's tracking the, the trading of a given piece of art uh, as it changes hands over time, the artist is getting a royalty right back to them. Um, and I think this, it's really compelling for artists to, to, to start building out their art galleries. And that's it's just one small community that I'm providing an example that I'm looking at uh, in terms of who's really coming into these metaverses. And, 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 and one more thing before I go off on another tangent. Um, <laughs> I, I think these metaverses are, are going to be, it's not going to be a winner take all, right? And I've, I've had so many discussions with investors who asked me, Jalad, well, this seems like 15, 20 years ago with the advent of social media platforms when MySpace and Facebook and Friendster were all duking it out. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, that's an appropriate comparable today. It's, it's not a winner take all type scenario. Each one of these metaverses, I reckon, are going to have their own unique cluster of communities that is going to continue to drive the value uh, of those in-game assets. Uh, and, and, you know, metaverses can be as open box and, you know, canvas-like to an extent, but some of these metaverses and some that I've seen seem to be catering towards a very niche interest, uh, whether it's, you know, you know, fantasy MMORPGs or, you know, cars as a collective interest. And it's a metaverse dedicated to a singular interest. And I think the future of the internet is really going to become clustered in, in these silos of knowledge. And I'm using silo as, a, as, a, as an analogy for metaverses, right? These metaverses are really going to cater to unique interests, uh, and some are going to be cross portal. And that's what I'm really excited about to see how you can traverse different metaverses with one singular avatar. That's a representation of who you are in the digital world. Um, yeah, that's, sorry, I know. Sorry. That's okay. No, we, we brought you here to talk. So we want you to talk. <laughs> so one, one thing you brought up was uh, scar scarcity. And that's an interesting point because one of the barriers for entry for Decentraland, I think, is the cost. Yeah. And I think that's one of the appeals for a platform like Earth2 is that it's a much more affordable platform, but it doesn't quite have the scarcity that Decentraland does. Do you think there's a world in which, in which both can exist and, and be successful? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think the metaverses that are, are providing this this layer over our world are, are going to have a very interesting appeal once you're able to cross collaborate with the actual physical world 
uh, and what it has available in the physical world and then recreating it into the metaverse. So what I like about Earth 2.0 is what I, I'm looking at it, I want to go and buy, you know, the High Line in Manhattan or, a, or you know, a block of land near the United Nations headquarters and do something unique around that, that bridges the virtual world and the real world in a way that's never been done before. And Decentraland can't do that, right? Decentraland is a, is a grid that's on an X and Y axis that's just, you know, a random map. Uh, and it doesn't have that direct connectivity to the real world, right? I, I envision a future where everyone is able to equip themselves with some sort of AR, VR technology that's non-invasive, and that's key here. Non-invasive, meaning it's not a huge headset. It doesn't make you stand out or look weird or some, some you know, social outcast because you're wearing this, you know, hardware on your head down the street. It's going to become fashionable. And, it's, and I know Apple is already working on technology around it. And Republic gets to see some brilliant companies that are solving these type of solutions. Uh, once that becomes mass adoption, uh, I think worlds like Earth 2 uh, are going to be extremely valuable. Uh, and, and when you combine that with some other creative content, right? Like I can see someone owning land in Earth 2.0 and then going to the restaurant holder that may own a restaurant in that same real land and doing an interesting relationship with them. And this is just the beginning. Businesses are, gonna, are going to start migrating into the metaverse en masse. And I, I guarantee you, these are the same conversations people were having in the early 90s when the internet was coming up. And you were trying to make a convic convincing argument as to why your business needs to be on the internet. Uh, and the same applies here. Why does your business need to be in the metaverse? And I haven't even touched upon some of the interesting academic integrations that could be done with R2.0, where students from all over the world can enter into this metaverse, into your metaverse, uh, I mean, into your land and really explore geography in a way that's never been done before. Someone's gonna figure it out. Someone's going to do it in the metaverse. There's no, no. doubt about it. Oh, I, so, I, I know just in my time on Earth2.io, I've learned more countries than I ever learned in high school <laughs> geography. <laughs> yeah, my, my flag knowledge has certainly improved. I, I will say that. <laughs> see, see, there you go. And that's important. That's hyper important. Look, I, I have a four-year-old daughter who, who lives in Minecraft. And Minecraft is fun and engaging, but it's just the beginning. I mean, I, I can't wait to see where academia goes with the metaverse and how it really manifests some of the creative things. You know, this is not a central decentralized game, but I'm really excited about Microsoft's flight simulator. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's a full onboard, I mean, full rendering uh, of the world down to city blocks. I mean, I was able to, I was seeing the demo and you could see your own house. You know, and, you know Jawad, I made a yeah. mistake of not sending you the trailer for her too. Uh, it, <laughs> we should have done that. <laughs> it, it's like it's like flight simulator, but better. Wow. It, so, I mean, I'm I'm I'm. I'm going to really take a deep dive into Earth Two, uh, and and see if the fund will make a considerable investment into some lands out there. Look, the fund is and and and. I, I don't want to talk too much about the fund before my compliance department reprimands me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not selling securities. This is not financial advice. Um, but what I will say in terms of the fund structure, the fund, aside from investing in virtual plots of land, we are, uh, the way the fund is structured, so allowed to make investments into upcoming metaverses, whether it's in their utility token or their operating company. Uh, and, and we want to find more companies uh, that have a deep vision. Uh, and then I love the team behind R2.io. Uh, it's very solid team. And, and Aaron had mentioned some huge milestones that I wasn't even aware of that's really uh, piqued my interest uh, because it seems like you guys are much farther along than some of the peer companies I've seen in the space. 
uh, and, and the team seems to be very well anchored with, with unique skill sets from everyone. I, I saw everyone on the team's background is, is uh, really just high quality triple A. Uh, so, so for me, so speaking, yeah, speaking of the fund, we, we did have a couple of questions we wanted to ask about that. Where, uh, so why the $25,000 minimum investment and why the maximum number of investors at 99? The fund originally had a, a minimum investment of 25000 uh, We are currently, our minimum investment is 100000 Wow. And our average investment into the fund is nearly 200000 So it, it's, we... We didn't expect the, the, the reception to be this overwhelming. I mean, we, we really, really became uh, overnight celebrities, so to speak, uh, with this virtual real estate fund, because to my knowledge, uh, we are the only actively managed virtual real estate fund in the world. And, and it's, it's really compelling for uh, in highly sophisticated investors to get exposure into this world with a team that's well-equipped uh, in, the, in the company that's really well backed by some of the biggest players in the fund, uh, in the space. Why we are limited to 99 investors is purely a function of some of the compliance and SEC requirements we would face. And that comes down to how the SEC uh, views virtual real estate. And as of now, they are not considered securities under the Security Act. If they end up being considered securities under the Securities Act and the fund has more than 100 investors, I mean 99 investors, the fund would be subject to layers and layers of compliance and regulation that today we're just not uh, ready to take on. So uh, really as a mitigation technique to some of the compliance requirements, we, we cap the fund at 99 investors. And we are deeply investigating and, and fleshing out an opportunity to launch a subsequent offering that would be more broadly available to all types of investors. And it would be agnostic to minimum investments. Uh, we really want to make this um, available and accessible to many, many folks. And I mean, the demand has been really overwhelming from investors who want to write, you know, $10,000, $15,000 checks into the fund. Uh, and we would love to give them exposure into this world. Uh, we're, we're just navigating some of the requirements with the SEC to make a broader offering. Uh, and I, I'm happy to say I, we, the fund is really targeting a, a liquidity event for our investors by listing it on an exchange, a public exchange. Um, I really can't get into exactly the timeline for it, but that's that's where we're taking it. And once it's listed on a public exchange, anybody can buy it into the into that asset. Well, that sounds really exciting. And my next question was relate. I think you kind of already answered it, but I'll still ask. Um, which was, has Republic struggled to convince people to jump on board? But it kind of sounds like you've had more enthusiasm and and demand for this than maybe you even anticipated. Well, that was the position that we took uh, prior to launching it, right? We were, we, we assumed that the interest would be very niche coming from a few Bitcoin billionaires or, or crypto funds. But the stratification of investors that we have in the fund currently is really, really exciting. We're very well rounded out. We have, you know, VC funds to crypto funds uh, to real estate funds to real really sophisticated real estate investors uh, who who are are also sharing in the hypothesis that virtual land is very similar to physical land, and these are and just to give you just a snapshot profile, these are investors who are you know. A little bit older, they're you know. I'm specifically talking about the real estate investor here. Uh, they're a little bit older. You wouldn't expect them to be as immersed into crypto, but to my surprise, uh, they've taught me a few things along the way, uh, and and have themselves taken the the deliberate position on teaching themselves about blockchain, understanding it, and diving in deeper. For them, the biggest it's not even criticism, but the biggest feedback has been, Jawad, I just 
don't have the time to really flesh this out, you know, you know, looking at land, figuring out the acquisition target, uh, figuring out what to develop on it, testing that cycle, does it fail, redoing it, it really turns into a full-time job. Now, our, our fund for an investor uh, provides them with exposure and, and we, we want to take a very active approach even with our investors in terms of communications and reporting and the fund is currently exploring an advisory council where uh, from amongst these 99 investors which every single one of them I speak to uh, before and after they invest to get an understanding of what, what they're getting into and always start off that this is highly risky um, of course uh, we want to build out a relationship with all of our LPs. And, and I am really only allowing LPs into the fund if they're bringing value beyond just a check. Um, I'm surrounded by people who are willing to blindly write me a check uh, you know, based off of past investments I've done with them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I, I, at this time and stage of this type of investment, we want folks who are more collaborative with us and can be helpful to us if I'm able to, you know, call them on a, on a short notice to get some advice or input. Uh, that'd be great. Um, I can give you an example. We have, as an investor, uh, someone from a very large ticket ticketing company, right? And they haven't been able to do a a physical public event for the last year because of COVID. They want to do one of their concerts in the metaverse. They invested in the fund. We're working with a team that's building out virtual stages. Uh, and we anticipate several thousand folks to attend these meta this metaverse concert uh, with some of the world's most renowned artists. Uh, this is just one example of how brands are looking at the metaverse. Yeah, and that, uh, that's the type of thing that excites me is the potential of just integrating earth one with the metaverses the, of doing concerts of doing entertainment of doing things that people want to see but because of the, the pandemic maybe they they don't want to go out in public but this gives them the opportunity to experience that type of thing totally totally and, I, and it's really just the beginning we have hotel investors in the funds who own portfolios of hotels and you know they've they're suffering too uh, I, I know many hotel proprietors and they're suffering and they asked us, Hey, can, can you render, can you render one of our hotels in the metaverse? And can we create a virtual hotel lobby and, and run up, you know, some sort of event uh, tied back to our guests in the real physical location? Can they order room service from the metaverse and have it delivered to their room? Wow. And these are the type of discussions we're having. It's truly just the beginning. I know um, it, recently you were able to order your first Domino's pizza from the metaverse. And it, it, it's, this was something that happened 25 years ago with the internet when somebody ordered the first pizza from the internet. So look, cycles repeat themselves. And if you understand history really well, you'll know that this is really just uh, another incarnation of the internet when it was launching in the early nineties. Yeah. Uh, and, and brands are, are brands for, for a brand like Gucci or Chanel for them to drop 200,000, 300,000 into an experimental investment and really try to manifest some interesting uh, activities, whether it's creating a virtual store and, and selling unique products that ship to your home. And then that's also connected to a unique NFT that represents your ownership in this product. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket for them. But what it comes back to us is the folks who are in the community is to continue making interesting activities uh, for people to continue coming back. And, yeah. And, and it's, yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. So one thing we'd notice uh, just based on Janine's interview with CNBC, your Twitter, uh, it seems that Decentraland's the primary part of your portfolio. Can you touch on why the central and specifically of interest and what other metaverses have caught Republic's attention? Uh, I can tell you that we are currently invested in the central and sandbox being the, the, the two largest allocations of our capital. Uh, we're invested in Axie Infinity, Insomnium Space and Crypto Voxels. Uh, 
and and I'm happy to share after this call our Open C portfolio page where we have where we publicly disclose some of our holdings uh, in, in across these metaverses. Yeah, I'll, for, I'll, I'll be happy to attest that to the show notes. For sure, thank you. Um, and um, what I for this why we chose Decentraland was because it's the farthest along. And what's really and this is this is going to really interest you guys. You know, Decentraland ICO'd back in 2016, 2017. And there was a bunch of ICOs happening around that time. The team at Decentraland could have easily pulled off an exit scam where they raised a bunch of money and the project just had a long debt. But they didn't. They stayed committed. They were one of the few ICOs during that time who were not exit scamming people and were truly honest about what they were doing. And they continue to do so. And, and we're very well connected with the team at Decentraland. Uh, and they have turned away speculators in mass. And I really appreciate that because what's going to happen is if you get, if all the big fish come in and they create these high barriers, the big fish will have no little fish to eat and the ecosystem will die off. Yeah. And that's interesting because Shane actually said this past weekend, that they had a angel investor come contact them and wanted to kind of take them on the path to go public. And he, he wasn't interested in it. He's like, no, that's not the path we want to take. But they, they, they just wanted to grow the value of the business and have it listed. They weren't interested in, is that what you're saying? They weren't interested in building out a community? No. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that. I don't know that, that yeah, Shane necessarily, um, the CEO got that, specific necessarily with why it was turned down but i think you know that was sort of the implication i think that we took away from it was that it was somebody simply looking to you know make some quick cash but maybe not invest in the communities or invest in the future vision in the same way that you're that you've been describing on the podcast i see i see um yeah you guys i i, I can tell you right now you're going to get a bunch of these these type of interested parties um, and I would look there, there's a time and place for speculation. And I appreciate that approach. I, 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 I mean, I've personally speculated on assets. I think all of us have, but it's, you really have to balance the, the ratio of speculators and active investors. Um, some speculators are good, uh, but they have to be managed, I guess. I, I it, and it's really hard to do that. If you're partnering with someone, if you don't want to partner with the speculator, let the speculator do their speculation in the secondary market. Uh, you really want to partner with the active investor, the, 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 the folks who are saying, we're going to build in this community. We're going to deploy resources beyond just, you know, buying land. We're, we're, we'll, we have, for example, Republic is really well connected with media and press, and we want to help these metaverses get more attention. And Republic has over a million users. We haven't even tapped into those million users in a meaningful way to enter the metaverse. Even the, the capital raise for this fund has been very quiet, very private on an invitation only basis. Uh, so you can see that we're, we're really just hyper-focused on you know, finding the, the appropriate land acquisition targets and already being in relationships with the right designers, developers, engineers, to, to build interesting things on these on this land, we want to be landlords. So we're also figuring out ways to make uh, and establish the appropriate contracts that are needed. For example, like a lease agreement when you rent an apartment, or a seller financing deal, or you can get very exotic with the type of transactions that happen in real estate, and they are happening in the virtual world. Uh, so for for us it's it's we we would tread cautiously with speculators i've had many speculators approach me as well to invest in the fund and said here we can give you you know a million dollars or 2 million dollars and take us to the moon so i i mean i appreciate i appreciate the zeal but today that's not that's not the position we're taking um and we, we, we really want to be collaborative with these worlds in any way we possibly can. Yeah, that, I, that absolutely makes sense. Um, and that, I mean, that's, 
I think really interesting and something that Aaron and I have talked about a lot beyond collaboration with the community is what are we actually going to get to see built out? And certainly without, if you're talking about more passive investors and speculation, they're not going to be you know, contributing in that way. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, so I think we've already talked a little bit about your engagement with Earth 2, which so far hasn't been, um, you know, huge, it sounds like, but it's something that that the fund may be looking into. Um, but I guess this is the part where we ask you if you have any questions for us about Earth2.io, if there's anything you want to know or that you're you're curious about with it. Absolutely, absolutely. My uh, really, I'm hyper interested in understanding the current phases that the platform is in. And I, I Aaron and I had briefly spoken about this earlier. Uh, I, I, I I'd like to understand the genesis of the phases, you know, from claiming land to resources to terrain, uh, and, and where exactly we are today, and when do you see it entering into phase three? So phase one is right now uh, is basically the claiming of land, mm -hmm. and phase two is when they're going to start integrating uh, more more things that people can do. Uh, they're going to have a a thing called Essence, which I think is going to be similar to what MANA is on Decentraland. And they're going to have things called EPLs, which are, are two property locations where people can give unique domains to their property. So if someone wants to, they have to use the Essence to create this EPL. And with that, they can give their property a domain like uh, Amazon or Apple, as long as it's not copyright protected. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to be resources uh, that you can mine on your properties or that are generated on your properties. Then they're going to start transitioning into phase three, which will be more of the, and I'll send you the link to the terrain video, which it'll blow you away. Uh, Please. But that's where it's going to be the integration of the, the augmented reality and the virtual reality. And people are going to start being able to interact with the things. Uh, they're going to have blueprints. Uh, people can build buildings on their land. Uh, you can, basically do anything you can on earth one within the metaverse of earth two is, wow. is the long-term vision. Will there be a builder tool for people to use to build out some of their creations? Yes. Amazing. And this is in addition to, uh, you know, exporting your code from another platform and, and redeploying it here. Well, see that, yeah, that's one thing that I'm, you know, not, fully sure of and uh, I don't know necessarily to what degree users will be allowed to sort of customize and make their own creations but that's definitely mm -hmm. going to be a part of it so I, I do think some of that sort of to be determined sort of what level of freedom yeah. the user has but yeah go ahead Aaron. yeah yeah just from what I've read I mean because I'm very in tune with what the developers and and the CEO talk about and they want the users to have full creativity. They want the users to be able to do everything possible. So totally. they're trying to build an engine that will handle all that. Right. And then mm -hmm. you, you had also um, asked about timeline, Jawad, and I believe that, so phase two is, I soon. mean, the, yeah, always the conventional phrase soon, but, but I, the expectation for at least the early part of phase two, I think is still, um, within this calendar month or so. It was supposed to be this month, but um, mm -hmm. actually this this is an interesting opportunity to ask you about something else <laughs> that we had, um, which is there's, it's kind of been, it's not been officially launched, but um, one of the potential supposed reasons for the delay in the phase two launch is, a, is Earth 2 forging a partnership with GoChain. Um, mm. which has not, it's not official, but it's been um, alluded to and sort of hinted at uh, to a degree that I think it's kind of clear that it's happening. So, um, so yeah, that, that pushed phase two out. Um, but I, I did kind of want to ask if that, if hearing about that, that potential partnership with GoChain would you know, potentially increase the interest of Republic's fund. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've, I'm seeing what GoChain is doing, and uh, these are the type of solutions these metaverses really need. These type of partnerships, uh, and and really, these are these are signals of validation in many ways. Uh, and, and and I can see that being a really scalable way for the fun, for 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 R two to really broadcast what they're doing. Uh, I 
I'm interested, has the announcement gone really public yet or still in private mode, stealth mode? And... So it's still in private mode, stealth mode, but uh, I have a good source and, and he's pretty much confirmed they're in contract negotiations right now and they expect the contract to be finalized within the next two weeks. Got it, got it. And they would be the underlying technology behind Essence? Yeah, and so we think, we don't know for sure. I mean, this is kind of speculative, but we think that Earth 2 is going to have their own token. They're not going to use the GoChain token or they're not going to use OMI. They're going to have their own token. In fact, Shane, the CEO, was asked about this in a recent chat and that someone asked him, are you going to have your own, uh, your own token? And he's like, we created our own world, didn't we? Yeah, he, <laughs> he he loves to be very coy and, and cheeky, but it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it does he it does indicate where he plans to go, where where they plan to go with this. How much have you guys? How much has the metaverse raised from its initial land offering? So just based on uh, some numbers that we crunched last month, as of March twentieth, it was forty million dollars. And this went right back to, to the organization. Yeah, this is pure pure profit for Earth 2. Okay. Yeah, great. because they, so, and the way that, that that number was arrived at was um, we are able to calculate what the new land values were. So we can get a pretty reliable number for when the tiles within the metaverse were sold from Earth 2 to the user, uh, where the numbers get a little more complex as far as what, Earth2.io has raised is they take 5% of profits on sales from user to user. So mm -hmm. if if Aaron sells me something at a $100 profit, they're taking $5. And that part is a little bit harder for a user without the sort of additional numbers to calculate. So that's where it's 40 plus. <laughs> but Got it. Got yeah. it. So, and that money, I'm assuming, uh, this was going to lead into my next question. Is, is there a DAO that's been established in this metaverse or are there DAOs being established by the users? That I don't know. Yeah, I'm okay. also not sure about that. That is a great question. Yeah, because I would imagine, I mean, for, for a lot of these metaverses, if they're manifesting decentralized uh, applications, having this governance mechanism through a decentralized autonomous organization is is really important and it's the key mechanism where uh, users and the or or folks who actually have own land to vote on certain changes in the metaverse. Uh, I, I know existing metaverses, they fund their DAO extremely well uh, from the initial offering and that fund essentially interchangeably using DAO and fund here. Uh, this DAO holds this capital uh, in the form of the utility token and hopefully it appreciates over time. Uh, and it's really the funding mechanism for the metaverse going out into the future. I know, uh, I know Decentraland is more than well funded for the next decade from their ICO and their mana holdings. Uh, and, and, and that's also very promising, but it also, if, if the Decentraland organization was to disappear tomorrow, the game would still continue. And, and, and it's really the closest manifestation to a decentralized metaverse that we've seen uh, after digging into the tech. So that's really why I think a DAO is, is hyper important. I'm pretty sure the, the foundational work on a DAO is already being worked on in our 2.0, it's somewhere. Uh, and this 40 million that's been raised, uh, I'm, is there a dedicated like developer fund from this 40 million that's being allocated for the future in terms of fostering uh, community engagement? So I know they're, they're, they're trying to expand their team. They're trying to hire more people so they can be a little bit more expedient with uh, the development of phase two and phase three. So yeah. they are putting back into the game kind of what's coming in. Yeah. Amazing. And I did get the impression that, um, and, you know, not that this is always a great explanation, but it may have taken off a bit more quickly than was anticipated <laughs> on their end. Um, so this, yeah. I think that this money may have come in fairly fast. And then, you know, with that comes the ability to hire, you know, additional quality personnel and build out the team more, which I know has been um, Shane's, you know, main focus, it seems lately. 
that's really the hardest part honestly that is that is one of the hardest part because uh even we're seeing it even decentraland is seeing it that the scarcity uh with developers and engineers and and, and blockchain engineers uh it's it's pretty high like people are booked for two three months i mean we've spoken with a few developers uh and designers that we needed for the metaverse and they said yeah i can do your project in three months uh, and it's some guy with a weird name, but uh, apparently, you know, this person is the most sought after developer or designer in the world. And I know there is third party architect firms, just like in the real world that are emerging. Uh, one of them being, I know, Voxel Architects that develop in-game assets and they're an architect firm for the metaverse. Uh, and they develop cool buildings for all different platforms. And it's really just this emergence of this new wave of businesses that are slowly entering the metaverse, whether it's an ad agency or an architect agency or a design agency, these, these type of businesses or data, for example, the, the data itself in these metaverses is going to be a gold mine. I, I, I've, I've said that to my team many times and it's really right now, the data is so fragmented, like understanding once this goes live, uh, you know, dollar per parcel or, or tile being generated or foot traffic. How many people passed by your parcel and didn't do anything? Oh, you're, or, you're, right? you're talking my language. Me and my spreadsheets love that kind of talk. I, Me too. Me too. That's the stuff that gets me really excited. Uh, and, that, and that's because I've, I've modeled virtually every single scenario you could think of in the real estate world uh, when I was in the hedge fund space. But you can get you can go down a rabbit hole on, on this. Like truly it's, it's, you'll start creating new data points and say, okay, we need to capture this data. Uh, and it's really, it's really like a box of Legos. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I see or two doing all those things that you're talking about having in-game designers, having in-game talent doing things. So knowing what you do know about or two now, are you going to look into it a little bit more? And if so, if you do invest in or two properties, what kind of properties will Republic typically go after? We, I, I, I will say this with certainty, uh, we're going to take a deep dive into or two, um, you know, just, just based off some of the things that Janine had mentioned to me uh, and, and Aaron as well. Um, I'm going to immerse myself in the community and really get a, take a deep dive into it. I mean, the fund we, we raised a little over, I mean, very close to $8 million out of our 10 million target and we haven't even fully deployed all of it yet. So there's a, a lot of dry powder, so to speak for us to deploy. Uh, we, we, there's a bunch of targets we've already identified, but we're also looking into new metaverses. Uh, and I, and I think, the early success that R2 has already had with their initial land offering is more than indication for me that this is something I need to be looking at aggressively. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I can I can answer your question in the types of properties in a very abstract way today, based off of what I understand. Uh, I, I'm we're going to take a, a different approach because this is really another layer onto Earth, right? It's a layer upon Earth. So what we were discussing earlier in the podcast being, you know, how you can merge, you know, street level, like street level physical activity to the virtual world. I want to figure out that bridge. And I think Earth 2 could be the catalyst for it. Uh, I want to look at where other folks, I mean, this is going to, even if I was in, in investing individually, I would look at it this way, is to see where other folks have already made considerable investments, right? I want to be able to build something interesting near you, and I hope that you build something interesting near me and then both of us benefit, All right? If we have, if you're building a conference center, I want to build cool hangout activities once the conference is done so people can come and hang out at my, you know, digital bar or lounge. And I've seen this happen in conferences in Decentraland where it feels like a, like a legitimate conference, you know, large studio, gallery, et cetera. People are paying attention. And then I start networking with these avatars after the conference is done uh, in, in cool things that are happening around the conference center, whether it's like some blog who bought a piece of land across from the conference center and put up cool art and people are talking about it. And the blogger has his little cluster of audience there. 
So I'm going to look at where people have already started buying land and think about what I can do with this new layer in this metaverse, right? Whether if, if I decide to do something in Antarctica, uh, I can, I don't know, I would think of some sort of expedition that's been done in the past and recreated and do something academic with it. It's really, it's, you can, the, the, I mean, the permutations here are limitless as to what you can build, but at a high level, I would look at where people have already staked land. Uh, I would try to, you know, find out who they are and understand it's really valuing land is understanding who the person is that bought it. Right. Because it's, if, if they're going to be building cool things around it, I want to collaborate with that person or entity. If they're just buying and holding, then, you know, I wish them the best of luck. Uh, but I, I, that's what I would do. And I really want to understand it, it's the, the, the parcel of land, the tile is really, go, is really connected to the person. I, and if you can build a relationship with that person, you'll know exactly what to do. And I think one of the things you're going to find exciting about Earth too is, is the community. Uh, there's many like guilds and mega cities where people are collaborating on, they're building ex ex exquisite maps and tile art with plans for the future of, of events, of virtual racing, of virtual, all kinds of things, gambling. Amazing, uh, amazing. So that's the kind of thing you're going to see with the Earth 2 community, I think that's going to really excite you. So what do you think the future holds for virtual land and where do you see this sector in five years, 20 years? I, I, I truly believe that this is going to be the, that, that gaming is going to be the new internet. And I, and I firmly believe that our exploration of the internet as we know it today is going to become this immersive AR, VR medium which is way more interactive. I, I truly believe uh, that we are heading towards Ready Player One. Uh, there's a few entrepreneurs that I know personally who are already well-funded that are building body sensitivity suits that would work in collaboration with the, the VR AR headset. And it's really going to be this hyper accelerated investment into these type of attributes and, and, and uh, experiences that is really going to manifest itself. Look, I mean, people are, are building relationships in these metaverses. And if we've learned anything from Second Life or The Sims or even World of Warcraft, people have found love in these platforms. You know, people have built out really deep relationships. Uh, I, 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 I truly believe that this is going to manifest our lives in ways just the way the internet has. Uh, and I'm really excited to see how hardware really catches up to some of these ambitions because there are a few hardware limitations that I know are being currently addressed. And I think once these metaverses start becoming more mobile friendly, we're going to see some interesting things happening with mass adoption. I, I, I continue to believe that metaverses serve as a conduit for, for social exchange and social interaction. And Perhaps, I mean, not perhaps, I believe it. It is, it is true. The pandemic has accelerated this migration into the metaverse, but human behavior is very interesting. And in something, when something is temporary that persists for too long, it's going to become permanent. And I, I think we are now permanently anchored in the metaverse. I think it's still very early. I believe investors who are, who are taking a deep and considerate approach in the metaverse today are going to be sitting very handsomely in five, five, 10 years, perhaps even sooner. Uh, I truly believe that's going to be the case. I think the biggest risk for these metaverses is, and I had mentioned this earlier in the podcast, is an overabundance of speculators. I, I hope, that does not become the case because you see it in crypto often, but the, the advent of decentralized applications uh, and, and what it provides is it's become clear as day. And I'm gonna go back to the GameStop short squeeze that happened a few months ago, which really revealed some of the, the, the inefficiencies in centralized financial markets today. And we, how Robinhood halted trading and other exchanges halted trading on GameStop because the central clearinghouse 
was unable to, to handle that level of order flow. And, and we, we really, I truly believe that decentralized finance where it's you and I directly transacting is going to become the, the, common, the common way of transacting with people uh, uh, um, and virtual land is here to stay. Well, one, I know that we've got to let you get going here, but one really quick follow-up question I wanted to ask was, you know, we've talked, I think we're very enthusiastic about this space over that time period, but what potential issues do you see coming up in the space? You've touched on too much speculation and maybe communities that aren't uh, robust. What, what other issues could crop up? I, I think the biggest risk, one of the greatest risks is really regulatory and how governments are, are interpreting these assets. Today, I, can, I know that the Securities and Exchange Commission does not have a clear interpretation of virtual real, estates as, virtual real estate assets as a security. Now, if they start viewing it as a security, uh, it's going to change the landscape pretty dramatically. There's going to be a lot of reporting that's going to be need, needed. Uh, there's going to be clear taxation on it. Uh, there's not going to be any interesting, there won't be any interesting way to mitigate taxes in a legal and compliant manner. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's going to be a huge hurdle really for the industry as a whole. Uh, and I hope that the industry can work together with the SEC and the regulators uh, to make this really uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, we're even though we're saying and we view it as a legitimate asset class, but in the eyes of the regulators, we want them to feel that level of comfort as well. And and the f I mean the full spirit of understanding the blockchain space uh, and how it relates back to virtual real estate and its classification uh, is is a is a huge risk. And I and I know that our fund really does highlight that in our in our offering documents. Um, in terms of regulatory risk, but I, I, that's a macro risk that's really affecting all the players in the space. And that's why you see some of these companies that are being uh, formed in offshore entities to really bypass it. And there's certain deals that as American investors, we're prohibited from investing in. So that's when an offshore entity comes into play, whether it's you know the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands. Uh, there are ways um, compliant ways to, to get exposure into these type of offerings. Uh, but it's really some of the regulatory understanding and, and Republic realm really wants to, 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 to guide the industry. I know Republic as, a, as an organization has worked very closely with, with regulators in Washington, DC in expanding the definition of what a crowdfunding offering is. And this is a little bit different from, from you know virtual real estate, but Republic is well equipped in terms of having those discussions with the compliance and regulatory people out in DC, uh, and we are continuing to work closely with them. Well, Jawad, uh, I came in with high expectations. I, I thought this would be a good conversation, and it's been beyond that. Uh, anything you want to promote or add before we wrap things up? Uh, no, thank you so much for for considering us. Uh, we're, we're hyper excited with what you guys are doing, and then. Truly, truly, honestly, I mean this sincerely. Uh, you know, after this call, we connect and, and really figure out ways to collaborate. I'm going to do a deep dive. And for anyone that's interested, please check us out at republicrealm.com. Uh, and if you're interested in investing, there's an application that you can fill out, and we'd be happy to hear from you. Well, thank you very much, Jawad. I, I can't uh, express uh, how awesome this has been. <laughs> uh, Aaron's you, already touched you. on it, but um, I think that our listeners will be very excited to hear some of the things that you've had to say today. And yeah, I really appreciate the time that you've taken. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, this has been the My Name is Human Earth2.io podcast brought to you by Earth2News.com. And we'll talk to you soon. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. 
So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Get up off your knees, girl. Get up. Stand face to face with your God. Oh God. And find out what you are. Hello, my name is you.